Hello. Hey, how you doing? We're already recording. Already record. We're going. Let's go. <laughs> ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sometimes I clip it, but I feel like we need to keep this in. Well, we'll see how it goes. In your boots. <laughs> Thanks totally for doing you. This. How are you doing today? Yeah, good. Really good. Awesome. You? Yeah, really good. Uh, Where are you based, Brendan? What's that? Where are you based? I'm in North Carolina right now in the U.S. and then mm -hmm. in the winter down in Florida. So East Coast. I have a feeling we know some same people. Really? Tell yeah, me. Yeah, through Lactigo. Oh, pro who do you know? <laughs> no way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She found me uh, uh, and online, obviously. And I worked with her for a little while. And then, yeah, she sent me a friend. And then, then she sent me another friend. And now I've got loads of people over in the States. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. So we'll clip that out, not to include her name. But the, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, Lactigo has, has brought people together. That stuff is amazing. Just for sure. mega fan. So that's cool. Small world. I'll, I'll hit her up. I was actually just texting her this morning. Well, let, let's, I actually think what you just said is an interesting kicking off point of what is the difference in what athletes need to know when they're in the beginning phase versus what you kind of said, Hey, this is my bread and butter. This is how I differentiate because I started cycling. So I'm in my maybe 14th year or 15th year of racing seriously the I caught the bug quickly the year before I picked up a bike I was over 35 pounds overweight drinking way too much found cycling through a friend and I remember I was in my attic with bicycling magazine and I was like oh carbs fats and protein and I ripped the page out and I was like oh there's different calories per each gram of this like what is had no I was eating chicken wings at a bar and drinking beer and I told my friend I don't know why I'm not losing weight. I'm running 45 minutes every day after work and I'm plowing 2000 calories in 15 yeah, minutes. Yeah. So just the discrepancy, you know, and then it's like, I fast forward. And so people, when I talk to them and they're like, well, I want to know everything about nutrition right now, like, dude, it's a journey. Yeah, and so, totally you yeah. know, how, I, that's like a huge question. But when I ask that, like, what kind of jumps to your mind? Cause you're, you know, you're going to forget more about nutrition than most of us are going to learn. So I just love to like tap, like, what did you just think when I asked you that? <laughs> uh, sometimes I forget that people know so little about mm. nutrition. I won't lie. That is sometimes I really have to like pair things back because I'll say to somebody, okay, so we're going to start you off and you're going to start eating 60 grams of carbohydrate per hour. And they're like, how many grams of carbohydrates is in my energy bar? You know, they have no idea. Mm -hmm. Whereas other people will come along and they'll say, oh, I made a batch of energy balls. I know no, this one has 22 grams and this one's got 30 grams, just depending on what size. So it's all about a conversation. Like and I, I'm very much a conversationalist, right? So I will figure out how, where somebody's motivations and where they're kind of, mm, where they're, like where their gaps in their knowledge are right mm. so that's the starting point like where where they where they get their nutrition knowledge in the first place you know if somebody is reading articles or somebody does find a magazine and that kind of thing what's um, the biggest gap sorry to jump in there i'm curious what is the like number one or two thing that people consistently have incorrect oh fueling on the bike oh, i would love definitely it yes. say that. Yeah, it's is that very, in uh, terms of carbs or timing or both? Uh, like carbs quantity? and time. No, carbs and uh, the t the type of carbohydrate. No, th that's the kind of more niche. Just yeah. the amount, really. Mm. Yeah, one athlete I had come on was feeling too much, and that's never happened before. How but much was too much? Him, What's your recommendation? I have like fifty. Well, he was this. he was eating like one hundred and twenty grams per hour on every train and ride. You know, okay. which is overkill and can maybe even blunt adaptations if you're looking for that sort of train uh, those really endurance adaptations not the high intensity stuff right mm -hmm. so he was yeah and that was one he was the biggest outlier everybody else nobody else will come to me and say oh yes I'm already eating 120 grams per hour in a race it's never as much as that and then hydration obviously hydration is a big one depending on their age the older they get the worse they are at at hydrating but then um the younger they are the easier it is to fix right for a lot mm -hmm. of people um but yeah the it's it's always to do with carbohydrates like cyclists will generally 
here on the radio or not on the radio but like on tv or on youtube or in an article and they say oh carbs are king so they're like right okay i have to eat all the carbs so they'll have like breakfast cereal that's full of carbs they'll have pizza in the evening they'll have recovery with pasta and but they kind of miss out the fact that the carbs are king during exercise do you know mm. so they might miss out that and then if they're fueling off of those high carb meals all the time they forget that their protein intake has suddenly gone through the floor and mm. they're not recovering they're not sleeping as well they're not uh, they're if they're in a calorie deficit they'll start to lose body weight or um lean muscle mass and they might look like they're losing weight but they're actually just losing muscle mass so there there's all those things to, to think about and that's where carbohydrate periodization obviously comes into its own and uh fueling each training session adequately and you know depending on what adaptation you're looking for from each session but as well looking at the rest of your day and your rest days and saying actually I'm not exercising as hard this day I've actually got a rest day what do I need what does my body need on this day and it wants more protein it probably wants more fats because you're not exercising so high so it's all those little um, ups and downs that people have to learn so I want to jump back to hydration in a second, but let's talk about more specifically the carbs then for, because I probably eat too many carbs and there's times where I just can tell them like, oh, I'm eating too many carbs and I'll go out. I'm a huge carb fan, but I don't think I would eat 120 on an endurance ride. But if I'm going out for like a five hour ride, I'm probably doing 500 grams of carbs. Mm -hmm. I'm also 80 kgs. So like the Watts or more, I don't know. I'd be curious. What's your, how do athletes find your recommendation of carbs per hour for an endurance ride? And then what about for, let's say a hard group ride, or if they're racing a race? So let's talk first about the endurance ride, yes. right? So you're obviously a coach, Brendan, right? Yes. So the key adaptation from an endurance ride is to upreg upregulate your endurance pathways. Okay. And to do that, your body has to be in a certain stressed state. And they talk, you hear a lot about these like train low sessions where you're starting off with low glycogen stores and that will help to attenuate those, um, sorry, increase the, the ability for those endurance pathways to, to take place, okay? Now, training with low carbohydrate stores is all well and good and, and sometimes it can be recommended, recommended, right? But if you, you're, it's not really something that you want to be doing all the time because it's it's increases your autonomic drive and it's really stressful and it's Super hard stressful. to recover from and it really really hard to implement especially during race season like don't touch it with a bar barge bowl around that time of season that's but, really good to hear because <laughs> people are going to hear are, this during races and like oh i need to go like train with no carbs and it just uh, yeah yeah no look people. it has its it has its place right i'm not one of those who says you always must eat you always must fuel your carb your uh, your endurance rights there is a time and a place but it has to be well managed and the coach and the nutritionist are such a key aspect of that but anyway i digress the five hour endurance rides you only have enough glycogen stored in your muscles anyway to last about two hours at that endurance pace mm -hmm. so by the end of that two hours unless you have been fueling with 120 grams per hour, that glycogen stores in your muscles will be depleted. Not obviously 100% depleted, but I'd say by the end of the third hour, it will be really depleted. You know, so you're finishing with low carbohydrate stores. And that's when the adaptations that you could get from train low sessions will be upregulated at that point because you're finishing with low carbohydrate stores, not, in, not necessarily that you've started with low carbohydrate stores. So for those sessions, it's not, if the intention is to improve your endurance, which it generally is, you, you do want to finish with low uh, glycogen stores. So you're not going to be fueling with 120 grams per hour because you're not going to tap into those stores. Okay, your body is just going to be fueling more off of the intake of carbohydrate mm -hmm. rather than your body's stores of it. So the intake, if it's a little bit lower than that, say about 80 or like 60 grams an hour, then the intake won't be enough to stop the stores being used up. And then you'll be able to finish with low carb stores or low glycogen stores. And that's what they talk about. The That's why the long endurance sessions are so darn important for anybody that wants to get 
faster at longer like they're improved their endurance capacity because and that's kind of why time crunched athletes have such difficulty doing it and they could be the type of people who train low sessions like starting out with low glycogen stores might be of more use since they're not riding long enough to actually deplete them literally just don't have the time what about is there an asterisk there if someone has another long ride the next day or a hard session so that they would be, would you say, hey, maybe that's not the day to do that because you're going to need the carbs and energy to do the following ride. So don't deplete them or still deplete them, but just makes you eat enough carbs at night. Um, because I've even looked like how long does it take to replace glycogen stores? And I obviously there's going to be an individual aspect to that at some point, but like the, the, Data online is not consistent. It's like 12 hours, 48 hours. I think one said 72. I'm like, that does not seem right. What's your problem? Yeah, no, 72, 24 hours is probably, it it is generally between 24 and 48 hours, right? For glycogen stores to return to pre-exercise levels. Okay. However, that's if you're eating a normal diet, okay? Mm. So as cyclists, in that post-exercise window, all that glycogen replenishment, all those pathways are upregulated to the max. So you mm-hmm. need to capitalize in that post-exercise window. And you can take, it could take about three or four hours if you do it quick enough. But if you refuel by the data is like between one and 1.2 grams per kilo of body weight per hour after that session, up mm-hmm. to three hours, but even maybe even longer if the session was super long or super hard. Uh, and you refuel with that amount of carbohydrate, obviously the fast release carbohydrate, so they can go straight into the, into the muscle. I mean, that's super easy to hit. That's for me as an 80 kg rider, that's like 80 grams of carbs after a ride. That's I'm shattering that. Yeah, no. And it's, it is super easy. Like you, you have your, um, you have your, say for example, I'm, I don't mind saying this. Right. So I, my, my go-to is Cocoa Pops, right? So Mm. I'll have a, well, I'm 60 kilos, so I'll have a 60, no, don't really. I'll have about a 50 gram bowl of that. And then mm-hmm. I'll have the the rice and bagel or rice and something else, you know? And there, that's that's that two hour window taken care of. And then if, if I have another hour and I still feel like I needed it because the session was so hard, then I'll have another like energy ball or something like that. However, the problem is that people wait too long so those pathways, that um, glycogen replenishment, those glycogen replenishment pathways would be downregulated later on, say after about five or six hours. And then they start tanning the, t- tanning the carbs, the fast release carbs. And mm. it doesn't go straight into storage because it kind of trickles in rather than going smashing in in, those three hour, in that three hour window afterwards. So it's trickling in. And then anything that doesn't, can't get into storage, into, into glycogen storage, just gets converted into body fat. And that's how you see weight gain. So let's say an athlete is 70 kgs, they finish and they, so they're going to go for the 70 grams an hour, but how fast do we digest this food also? Cause it's not like I put it in my mouth and it's like, Oh, it's, it's replaced. Cause I, have this <laughs> air, you know, I had this error and I actually was just talking to Landry, another coach. And I, we were chatting at Chipotle after crushing this five hour gravel race. It was like 5,500 KJs. No, maybe it was a six hour race. Do we hit 6,000? It was a lot of KJs. And we're like crushing Chipotle. I'm like, here's a question though. I'm super hungry. I'm going to eat this whole Chipotle bowl. It's clearly more carbs than I could absorb in an hour, even if I was racing. He's like, but dude, question. it's, it's digestion. Chipotle? Oh, a uh, burrito bowl. Rice, uh-huh, okay, yeah. rice yeah. tortilla shell. Oh my God. You guys don't have Chipotle? I never even thought about that. I thought that. you were talking about the little sausages. Aren't they called the pe- chipotle sausages? Uh, no, those are... Chipotle is a pepper. So... <gasps> right, okay. This is interesting. Okay. You know, yeah, every day. Rice, carbs, like vegetables. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, but Brendan, digestion. He's like, you're not going to digest that instantly. So like, how do we... Do you eat to hunger? Do you say, well, I did three hours, so I should eat 70 kgs times three hours, so 210 grams, or just eat to your so full, or like, you know, the, the digestion piece. The capacity thing is definitely, it's tricky, right? So fiber, obviously, if you have um, a bunch of carbohydrates that are full in fiber, then that is going to change your, um, how quickly those carbohydrates are going to be delivered into the, mu- the muscle. Okay. Mm. Basically it's the amount, because if you've got like a bowl of beans, 
the fiber in that is going to be most of the carbohydrate, not most, but it's going to be, it's going to form quite a lot of that carbohydrate. If you've got plain rice, that's just pure carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. So that's going to go straight into the muscle. And because it's, uh, it's to do with the glycemic index, right? right? Rice in particular is a very high glycemic index carbohydrate, which means it's uh, digested and delivered it out into circulation, increases your blood sugar. So that's, that that's it identified in the blood in circulation immediately after or sorry not immediately after but uh, on a scale of how quickly it can get to your get into circulation things with higher fiber have a lower glycemic index and they will take a little bit longer then if you eat them with a bunch of fat that will slow down the mm -hmm. emptying of your stomach of those carbohydrates because the fat takes so long to leave your stomach mm -hmm. um and then it just depends on the type of carbohydrate. If it's a more uh, glucose-based carbohydrate, like maltodextrin and rice in itself, they go straight into circulation. But other ones like fructose, that goes through your liver first and then gets out into circulation. So it takes a little bit longer. However, your liver stores of glycogen are also of great importance when you're cycling or when oh, for everybody, right? Not just for cyclists. But when you're finished, your store, um, your liver glycogen, it can only store about 40 grams of carbohydrate. And if it's depleted at the end of a ride and then you don't replete it specifically with fructose based carbohydrate, then later in the day, you're basically going to be on this big, massive sugar spikes and curves and oh, dips and everything. And it's just, it's just car crashes. But uh, so that's why containing or fructose containing carbohydrates after the ride are also very important and before. So, okay. I love nutrition because that was so many nuances to like, well, the glycemic index matters. And is there fat? And is there this? And if it's fructose and if it's glucose, it's like, dude, I'm just in the line at Chipotle. Like I just crush this ride. What do I order? And so let's make mm -hmm. a takeaway. Rider crushes. I think we've established if you're doing an endurance ride, you know, moderate amount of carbs, you don't have to do overkill. And if you deplete them, that's fine. Just don't, you know, think of the next ride also. And then what about for a race? What's like, let's give a takeaway of like how, what's an actionable item that someone that listens to this? Cause I think we're that your knowledge that was so detailed and on point, but yeah. most listeners are going to be like, wait, what is she doing? Like everyone's the head explosion emoji was just like, holy crap. I mean, I yeah, feel see, like this is why it takes three months for me to work with an athlete. A hundred percent. I mean, I'll even talk to Landry and, I, and, and we'll talk about the glycemic index. I'm like, wait, but I put honey on this. Maybe I should be using, um, God, what's it's not hemp. Maple it's, syrup. No, I drink that on the bike instead of gel. Oh dear. Um, oh my God. I used it this morning. It's the brown liquid. Uh, not the cacti, but agave agave. Thank you. <laughs> surprised i knew that one and it was just like all from glycemic index stuff and it's like oh my god this is like we could go down the rabbit hole but i think would when you were talking about the rice being higher glycemic index that's good though post ride big mega ride right okay and is that why cereal which is mostly sugar is okay post ride but don't eat that when you're sitting around on monday morning is that well, correct you can't really call it sugar because sometimes it's sugar implies that it might be sucrose, which it's not. Uh, it's again more maltodextrin based. Say, for example, cocoa pops are anyway. If it's got if honey nut cornflakes, probably have more fructose. And isn't it just table sugar? So, what is so, table sugar? Table sugar. Uh, is table sugar is sucrose, but it's it's um, it's basically simplified uh, glucose and fructose it's okay. a one-to-one -one ratio mm -hmm. your priority is really glucose because it's just so fast right mm -hmm. so but obviously you don't talk to people in glucose terms you talk to them in food terms right do you and think cereal's bad is ce no no, no cereal's perfect this is it because it's more post ride or glucose. all the time oh all the time <laughs> really no no post post right okay because it is such a fast release carbohydrate right and it will go into circulation and into the working muscle or into the worked muscle. As, because as now I've just heard a lot more people talking about, well, if I'm eating sugar, then I'm blunting fat burning. And that's a negative, obviously. No, that's pre-ride. Okay. Okay. Now that's a different kettle of fish. 
really so, say, so just so I'm sure, save the cereal for post ride. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. One hundred percent. Or things like Harry Bowl, right? You see, like there was a really great video of one of the really tall guys, Hugo Carthy. Hugo Carthy, and he writes for EF, doesn't he? Mm-hmm. Uh, absolutely shoveling in handfuls of Harry Bowl after one of the stages. Yeah. Uh, or was that one of the classic races? I don't know. But like those guys, their nutritionists will literally walk around with basic bag suitcases of Haribo because it's just such a, a quick release carbohydrate and for recovery it's perfect and contains fructose as well so mm-hmm. I don't know what the ratio is don't ask me that but uh, in terms of recovery it's pretty good now is there a point where you're eating too much Haribo and like you said that sugar is getting converted to fat because like how much Haribo is too much Haribo well it's almost gram for gram uh, carbohydrate so 50 say 60 grams of Haribo is yeah. 50 grams of carbohydrate right so, but so i mean like can so that could, be 70, your, that could be one of your hours so okay that's one hour i mean i could sit i could crush 250 grams after a ride that's probably too yeah, much of course you could yeah but you, that's why you need a plan for these things right right so i'm saying <laughs> that's too much don't eat the whole bag yeah 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 well it would be yes because there is a there is a limit you know your stomach can only empty things quick enough and then all the different transporters that will empty those carbohydrates out into circulation from your intestinal tract they have a limit too so and they'll be still digesting your stomach will still be emptying they'll still be digesting long after those three hours are finished so beyond that then you've eaten too much and you're just gonna it's just gonna go into storage fat storage Ooh, i don't want that let's no. talk let's talk about the hydration piece that you brought up because this is tricky especially um i don't know if uk gets as hot but down here in the southeast like oh man we're gonna have the fahrenheit celsius issue right now it was 99 for most of this gravel race so god i don't know my let me see what is that in celsius 99 f to c it was 37 c for a lot of the gravel race just torturous and and not a lot of airflow there as well is there no, not enough. Um, let's say it's 30 C. I see that a lot in TV. So like 90 ish, you know, or, and maybe the hydration piece is not just when it's hot. When you say people aren't hydrating properly, how do they figure out what they need to be doing? And then what are the errors that you see people kind of going through? Well, first thing in the morning, really what people should be doing is drinking about half a liter. That's a, uh, I mean, it just, it gets, you're obviously not drinking for about eight hours overnight. So your body is kind of in a dehydrated oh, yeah. state. I would say so, a liter. That's only half a liter, 16 ounces. Yeah, I do. Okay, I do. Look, small people, short people, whatever. Yeah. Um, Did you so, call me fat? No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, I got roasted on the podcast. <laughs> Dang. Okay. So, so I, yeah, that's, I mean, no, that's a good point. I be the first thing that they do on a day. I think that that alone would help people realize actually I've been walking around dehydrated all this time then I start my bike ride I'm already dehydrated it's a three-hour bike ride and I'll only drink like 500 mils can you imagine I mean it scares me sometimes how dehydrated I realize some people are I got a guy I'm working with some people over in the in Dubai at the moment and he just did a sweat test for me and he is sweating 2.2 liters an hour whoa which is up there with probably one of some of the highest sweat rates that you see. But obviously the humidity over there and the heat over there, don't ask me what, I think it's in the 40s. Probably. Like when you're talking about degrees. So like, that's just huge. Then you have to kind of, you have to try and say to yourself, right, you're not going to be able to f- or hydrate with 2.2 liters per hour. So there has to be a limit. You have to start hydrated in the first instance. Mm-hmm. The max he's probably going to be able to take on is about 750 because he's a small person like this is the thing he's not huge wow. so if he can aim for 750 mil per hour on the bike then we can establish what a rehydration protocol would be to get him rehydrated to the point where he's not going to start the next session the day after already dehydrated mm-hmm. um so sweat tests are honestly they're the most useful things for people to do how does um, someone take it what do they do to take a sweat test Where oh you- it's very simple um you you weigh yourself before a bike ride 
mm-hmm. you pick a pick a ride where it's only like between 90 minutes or two hours mm-hmm. otherwise you're kind of talking about glycogen depletion being part of the weight loss mm-hmm. so you um yeah you weigh yourself before and after in the nude make sure you dry yourself off after mm-hmm. so you're not like sweat still isn't on your body or in your hair or you know on your kit that's why you weigh yourself in the nude and then you record how much you drank how much you ate if you had any pee stops uh hopefully not because kind of complicates things either you have to pee in a cup to measure it or you I'll just estimate it um and then there's formulas basically that will just throw out your sweat rate per hour and uh then if you know or I can estimate your sodium concentration so there's an average sodium concentration uh, milligrams per liter of sweat if that's high, then we'll have a sodium replenishment protocol as well, or we'll just kind of estimate things based on averages for people. So is the, te- you know, how does someone know if they're dehydrated? Like, well, see, they don't. That's the thing. Say, for example, right, you, we have a thing called the, uh, the what method. Okay. So, and we'll use this if somebody's going out, going off in a training camp or something, right. But there's three things that would identify if you woken up in the morning, you're dehydrated. Number one is obviously the thirst scale. On a scale of one to 10, how thirsty are you? Right now, I'm probably about a five. So then you uh, you look at the color of your urine. They, and it, there's a scale obviously of that, if it's like pale yellow or kind of dark brown um, and you identify what color of that is. Then the other one is weight. What should it be in the morning? Sorry to jump in there. About a three. Is pale yellow? Is three is light? Three. Is it my? I I almost wonder sometimes if I'm over hydrating. It should look see through. Like it oh, okay. See-through. Yeah. So it like um, it depends on what color your screen is right now. But I mean, this would probably not be a good color because it's Got too it. dark. Yeah. It's too uh yeah mostly see through. More like, clear than yellow. We'll yeah. Say. Yeah. And then the other one is your weight. So if your body weight has changed by more than 1% overnight, then you're, is it 2%? Between one and 2%, say, over one or 2%, then you've woken up dehydrated. And mm-hmm. that's just a case of you weigh yourself each day. And if it's if it's too high of a change, then you know you're, um, you're dehydrated. And those two of those things together, say dark urine and um, too much of a body weight change, then you probably are dehydrated. The thing is, you can't use thirst on its own. If you wait, say runners are are brilliant for this, but if you wait for the thirst response, uh, for like thirst to be your indicator of, oh yeah, I need to be, I need to drink now. You're already 2% dehydrated. So you're already seeing performance decrements as a result of that 2% dehydration. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that was the thing with this gravel race. I'll usually try to do, I think ounces, like 40 ounces, two bottles, two normal size bottles per hour. Yeah. Um, and then I I still don't know exactly. I think I am relatively salty sweater, but not like crazy salty. So I'll do about like 600 grams of sodium an hour normally. So I was just kind of mm-hmm. doubling that. Um, would you think that's too much or... Was, that's hard that's hard to say so you're saying you're saying you're drinking 40 ounces per hour yeah when it's that hot and sweating a ton so that's 1.3 how tall are you brendan six five mm, yeah you can probably tolerate all of that 1.1 1. 1. i mean that's what like down when i lived in tennessee that was the protocol for like everybody everybody was two yeah. bottles an hour like because yeah. you're just wet like it's so humid I don't care if it's five in the morning, you are just dripping, uh, like to the point you have to wear gloves or you would notice like your hands are slippery on the bars. Sure. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I mean, sodium concentrations are difficult to, 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 to estimate. There is obviously, there are averages, there are outliers and all that kind of thing. So it'd be really hard for me to say like what mm-hmm. a recommended sodium protocol would be for somebody without actually looking into there how would someone do are there any tests it. people can do or like how does or do you have to go to a lab yeah or? there are there are sodium so you can get there are bioanalyzers biosensors that, that do this uh nicks have one 
Okay. Uh, but it's not new. It's not, sorry, it's not, a, it's not been around all that long and it has its glitches, but it can give you a sodium concentration of your sweat. So you'll be able to see what, what's your sweat rate per hour. The other method is you put a, you put a patch on. Now Gatorade have got a patch that you can put on and I'm not sure how, but I think it can tell you what your sweat rate is, or sorry, what your sodium concentration is, but they're disposable. Uh, again, probably not really all that accurate. The, the most uh, benefit or the most accurate one would be is putting a patch on your forearm, sorry, on your forearm and covering it over with a kind of a plaster type thing that stops it from running out, swap, stops the sweat from running out. Uh, one of those, what do you call them, tagaderm yeah. um, patches. Mm -hmm. And you take a sample from it after whatever the duration has been, take a sample of it and you put it onto an analyzer and it will tell you what the sodium concentration is. And then there are formulas that will tell you what your whole body sweat rate is compared to what it was in your arm because you've got different sweat totally. pockets, if you like, uh, sweat. Um, oh, it gets rain, complicated quickly. Per, per body weight or per, yeah. per body part. Yeah, it does. Okay. So we had some other uh, big bullet points here. Ones I definitely want to hit on of managing weight loss without losing power. Mm. This comes back to the carbohydrate periodization mm. part, right? Mm -hmm. So that cyclist I told you who has cereal in the morning, uh, pasta at lunch and pizza at dinner, right? There's just carbs all day long. If I was to look at that, and it's always the case, nobody can ever hit their protein requirements, right? Protein is that thing, obviously, that retains muscle mass, lean muscle mass. So if somebody, if I put somebody into a calorie deficit, I better make sure that none of that body weight loss is from muscle mass. They're going to lose power. They're going to sleep shit because their um, their protein requirements for normal hormone uh, production will be uh, hampered and they're just going to feel a little bit rubbish, right? So, but obviously power coming from muscle you want to retain as much of that as possible. Mm -hmm. So periodizing your carbohydrate, but using protein as the kind of basic element of each of those meals, you know, that, that kind of never really changes for a lot of uh, athletes, like what your protein requirements are on a daily basis um, kind of per meal, it doesn't change too much. So if I say to somebody, I need you to have 30 grams of protein at least four times a day, then put your carbohydrates on top of that, depending on what the training session is. Medium to low carb for rest days, high carb for your training days. That alone, like that, that information alone and that kind of planning alone is kind of the biggest win for me um, when it comes to weight loss for athletes without losing power. I think that's important to point out too, for maybe the newer listener who might, they've heard the word periodization, periodize your carbs. Like, wait, what does that mean for training? And then Ellen finish it off with based on your hard session, you eat differently than if you're on a rest day. Um, and there's blogs that go in depth on that and just use the carbs as fuel for your harder sessions. And then this kind of also ties into the first part of the conversation. You know, you don't need to have all these carbs for an endurance ride, but think about what's the next session. If you're going to have a hard ride the next day, you might need to lean the diet towards carbs after the long ride so that you're fueled to have the energy to put out the big watts if your coach has a big ride the next day. Absolutely. Um, yeah. That's a really, I love that aspect of anchoring it with the protein using the carbs for energy for the specific intervals and then is it fair to say that the correct amount of fat that we need is just going to get into the diet through normal healthy eating or do you have a yeah. or avoidance aspect for that well this is where say if because we we're talking specifically here about weight loss right fat is generally the one that does have to be decreased quite a bit because okay. With a gram of fat, you basically have nine calories, right? A gram of carbohydrate is four calories, right? Mm -hmm. there, it's almost double the amount of energy for the same amount of food. So, and it's not very uh, satiating. So it doesn't really fill you up, right? You have, a, uh, yeah, if you had a tablespoon of, 
tablespoon of peanut butter versus like a whole big bowl of salads. They might be the same amount of carbohydrate and that's so called, sad. It's not that's fair. Called energy density. Yeah. Um, so I need to be, I need to fill up those athletes because they need to not think they're in a calorie deficit because they're eating so much food, right? And I always get that. Why am I eating so much food and I'm still losing weight? But it's because there's a lot of volume for not a lot of calories or for a little less calories, obviously, than if there was a lot more fat in it. Mm -hmm. So we'll make sure that we're keeping our fat intake from beneficial sources that will help with recovery. So your omega threes and your uh, unsaturated fats and that kind of thing. Obviously, I'm not going to tell someone that they can't have cheese. OK, that would be that would be awful. So it's just I will. <laughs> it's just no, about I, I just where I, that would be. I think one of my friends one time, shout out to Andrew, a uh, guy I raced with back in 2012, for those that remember the Mount Bora and Nalgene squad. And we were talking about cheese. And he's like, I always just ask myself, what's the nutritional value of that piece of cheese? And I think I'm the, I more lean to, you know, you got to live if you have to be a happy cyclist. So if the bowl of ice cream is going to make you really happy and you go to bed and whatever, like then you got to fit in sometimes don't do it all the time. But I, I do ask myself, I'm like, is this helping me get faster? Or is this just my, like, you know, primate brain being like, oh, that cheese, that looks really good. Then you put it in your mouth, you get happy for three seconds. And you're like, oh, damn, I shouldn't have eaten that. So, well, that's the question we ask them then. What's your priority? Right. If exactly. your priority, yes. and it depends where you are in your season, right? What's the priority here? Are you out for dinner with your mates and that burger is looking just really good then your priority is to have that burger and enjoy your time with your mates right mm -hmm. listen to that podcast with uh, your man cooper the other mm -hmm. the other week yeah shout um, out cooper and he talks about like going out for for burgers with his mates and there is nothing better that is my that's my go-to is a big juicy dirty burger mm -hmm. and if someone tells me that i can't have that then that's probably not someone i want to work with because right. we have this 80% rule. If you can stick to your plan 80% of the time, and if you add up the amount of meals in your week, and then you scraped off 20% of it, it's actually quite a lot of meals, right? right. So if you can stick to your plan 80% of the time, and then go enjoy your time and have the cheese or whatever it might be, whatever your guilty pleasure is, um, then enjoy that for what it is and do not feel guilty about it. And that, I think that can just screw up. Timing is also huge when it's holiday time and there's all these treats and cook. I love cookies and I love potato chips. So if there's cookies that my sister made and they get sent here, I bring it out on a bike ride and I actually yeah. will then eat it. And I can, sometimes I don't feel great when I'm eating it and extra. I'm like, Oh, and it's a good reminder to me. Like, this is not something I want to be eating all the time. Yeah. Whereas I know it's very quite often like, Oh, I rode three hours. I can eat whatever I want. And then people see the negative like you can't really do that um, if, if you're going for performance. And so I think the timing is something that I've used. And uh, Dan Chabanov, um, he was on a on the first podcast I had. This was probably 14 years ago. And he brought this up. He's like, bring the treats on the bike. And I always, it, that always stuck with me. So let me, what do you think of counting calories for an athlete that doesn't know portion size and doesn't know any, for me, when I didn't know anything, I did count calories. Do you recommend that as educational or do you think it leads to bad habits? I think plan calories. That's my, Ooh, that's like my, that. that's my take on that because cool. you can count your calories after you've eaten the meal and then you realized, Oh God, that was all my calories for the one day in one meal. Cool. But if you planned it ahead and that's why having a nutrition plan is so darn useful. I don't talk in calories for one, for one thing. Right. But if you can plan ahead and say, okay, well, I've got, got chicken and rice and i've got my overnight oats for the morning i've got my chicken and rice for recovery and then i've got my salmon and sweet potatoes for my dinner afterwards how much of those do i actually need right and that plan ahead will actually show you that oh if i throw on half or like a i don't know like a big handful of cheese on top of my chicken and rice it's probably going to throw me over my calorie requirement so that's why that's where i will use it but i don't feel like people are uh, are educated enough to to track calories uh without knowing anything about what they need and especially with cycling because it's so that that carbohydrate periodization it is complicated mm -hmm. like do you know it's, it's just not easy to get right so if i try and get an elite athlete 
to try and start learning how to uh, periodize carbohydrates and calorie count and try and be in a calorie deficit if that's what they wanted to do. It's, I wish there was something that I could compare it to in terms of cycling and coaching, uh, you know, that isn't useful. What do you find is the least useful thing for cyclists in terms of coaching and training? Uh, what do I think is, what do you mean? What do I think is the u- least? Just useful? in terms of people analyzing data or like um, being accountable to data. God. I would say it's there. more over focused on finding the magical workout and like the mm. drawing conclusions that aren't necessarily true like oh i did this ride so this happened in the correlation um that's a tough question that's a really good question uh, i okay think... so when you think about that i'll just go back to this uh, this calorie counting thing it can be useful for people to learn what portion sizes are Don't okay get me wrong. cool but in terms of in terms of like what their goals are, what their body composition goals are, what their performance goals are, unless they're using it with the correct information to plan meals ahead, then it's kind of useless. I think the best thing, the a huge takeaway from this podcast is that someone's going to tune in and, and it in an hour, it's going to show how much detail all of these little pockets have that you have to, like, if you want to quote unquote, get good at nutrition, you got to like, just learn a lot of stuff. And that's what my journey started with understanding portion size, and then understanding fueling and then understanding recovery and then understanding timing and then understanding, wait, why am I gaining weight? And I'm riding all this amount. Oh, I'm over fueling here. And, and it just continues to unravel and you learn more about what works for you, what doesn't work for you, what works for your friend might not work for you. And then also being realistic. I mean, it just, it, just keeps unraveling well it's a whole other discipline of cycling yes like especially with any of the triathletes i work with right they they are complicated i mean and just in the sense that they there's so many there's so many sessions that they have to try and schedule in right but nutrition for them is the fourth part of their sport do you know and i think more people are getting that more people are getting the sense of that and realizing that actually maybe the fast wheels aren't going to make me faster. Maybe it's what I'm fueling with that's going to make me faster. And it's it, there's definitely a shift. And you see it most, <clears throat> sorry, I see it most now with juniors coming through. They're like, everybody's really good, really young, you know? And I have to get to that level as quickly as possible. So they, they will work with a nutritionist. And for a lot of the junior guys I work with, they um, they haven't developed any of the bad habits. So it's easy for them to get, you know, good at nutrition. And, um, but yeah, I think that's probably one of the reasons why the juniors these days are so shit hot mm. is because they've got all the little things, you know? That's amazing. What is, let, let's talk uh, two words that you would put down, avoiding cramps. There was an- oh. in- it was yeah. an interesting post. Do you know Alan Lim from Scratch? No, See? I know the company Scratch. I don't know him though. Yeah, so look, look up Alan Lim. He's an interesting guy. You might have some things up your alley. He was talking about how a lot of times cramps are simply your muscles. You just can't do the workload. And that's a cramp. It's not necessarily always sodium. And he had made a post about ways to like i think it was like you drink something really sour and it can reverse what's like cramping however your brain processes this cramp but i thought that was interesting and so i've always leaned on cramps are mostly your body just can't handle the effort like and this is why i think training races are extremely important people have you know they go through training sessions and then they have maybe only four events in the summer and they don't train hard enough so then they go to this event in an hour and a half in it's like whoa dude i'm throttling my body I see people cramp there. So I try to, I try to not have that happen by having hard group rides sporadically have those hard efforts, but that's kind of my verbal diarrhea of when I think avoiding cramps as you as a nutritionist and works with a lot of different athletes, what does avoiding cramps mean to you? It's kind of process of elimination, really. If somebody is in the middle of the season, they've already done a bunch of races, then I can't use the uh, intensity factor factor being the 
uh, thing that's causing the cramps because there's so many things but carbohydrate depletion anyway well glycogen depletion right if the carbs aren't there then your body's going to be looking your muscles are going to be looking for um, fuel from somewhere and they will start to break down um protein so muscle protein to so you can cram from not enough carbs yeah absolutely I did not know that then the other one obviously is dehydration so right. uh there's not enough fluid in the in circulation for your blood to be able to pump blood or pump pump nutrition nutrition nu <laughs> nutrients to the working <laughs> muscle and that can lead to cramps also because just simply the nutrition isn't getting there uh then you've got um electrolyte imbalances so that could come from a lack of dehydration so the nutrients like uh potassium magnesium and um, those kind of things they are not getting to the muscle um and then the other one is um oh crikey oh there's there is more like it's not it's not always dehydration or it's not always sodium that um depletion that can cause cramps right so i'll have to obviously go through all this i'll have to make sure obviously that they're fueling carbohydrate correctly that they're hydrating correct correctly if <clears throat> if we've identified that they can't take on enough fluid during the bike ride then I will preload them um, hydrative, hydratingly. That's not, not, not a word. I will prehydrate them aggressively mm. before the session, right? That will include sodium loading as part of that as well. How much and sodium loading? So the, it'll depend on the size of the athlete, but say for a 70 kilo guy, it'll be about two liters of water with five grams of table salt. And that will, but it has to be finished two hours before the session. So five grams of salt is 2000 grams of sodium, sure. correct? So it's drawn to about 800 mils of water because you'll pee all the rest of it out. Okay. Um, but that's just a, that's just a, an aggressive hydration strategy. And so, hang, hang on a second. My video just skipped there Go for ahead. a second. So five grams, that's 40%. Those are 2000 grams of sodium. Am I, is that correct? Milligrams of sodium? Five grams of table salt. Is... So it's sodium chloride um just the plain table salt not like um not like what you call it but i thought one gram of table salt was 400 milligrams of sodium uh 400 milligrams of sodium that doesn't sound like a lot five grams no but i'm saying let me make sure i have my calculations correct one gram of salt uh -huh. is 400 <laughs> milligrams of sodium oh uh I'm not 100% of the molecular weights of each of them, like between the sodium. Well, just so grams, somebody doesn't but... hear five grams and go for five grams of sodium, because that no, would be... it's five grams of table salt, okay. right? It is sodium chloride, but okay. plain table salt. And then if they need any more, we can add in certain types of the carbohydrates um, as well that will try and hold on to a little bit more or a little bit more hydration. So that will obviously sodium load them as well as uh, hydrating them to about 800 mils before the actual event begins. And uh, that's one aspect. The other one you mentioned there is sour foods, but the pickle juice in particular yeah. is the key thing that switches off the, the neural pathways that can be causing cramp, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I've heard reports that's only temporary. Mm -hmm. you're not really solving the issue of the cramp like where the cramp is coming from it's just a, a temporary fix and i think that's probably why they've called them cramp fix but they are only temporary and it, like i said they're not really solving the issue itself um but like things like um things like strength and conditioning right so when you're talking there about uh race efforts okay and doing them early in the season, probably what you're trying to do there with your guys are like um, stimulating the muscle so that it's um, really active, right? And it's doing as much power as it's going to be. If you say move your bike position or you wear different shoes, all of a sudden you're probably going to start using different little muscle groups that haven't been worked before. And you put them into a race situation and they're the ones that might cramp up. But if you throw in some strength and conditioning that targets all those things kind of on a regular basis and you do your foam rolling and you do your stretching, then you're, um, you're working those muscles that can do a job and do it well. And they're not going to be your debilitating factor when it comes to a race. Mm, I love that. Do you know, are the car is the water that's retained by carb loading usable for hydration purposes? 
Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you've got four grams. So yeah, four grams of water yeah. per every one gram of carbohydrate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If you went in glycogen depleted versus fully glycogen loaded, you're going to have a lot more water at your disposal. Do you know what the stance is on those things? You mentioned potassium, magnesium, calcium. There are some drink mixes now that are only using like table salt because there's a study that shows that those extra things had no bearing on hydration. Do you agree with that? Or do you still think getting... Bearing on hydration, possibly. Maybe they don't have much bearing on hydration. However, like calcium and potassium are all part of the muscle contraction um and relaxation process mm -hmm. so if you're sweating out all your all your calcium and all of a sudden there's none left it's going to get leached from your bones so that's obviously not a good aspect so the calcium in there might be more beneficial for that aspect of mm -hmm. exercise versus the hydration aspect of exercise because I've switched off of drink mixes and I'm trying to think the one that I actually used to use did not even have potassium, magnesium, calcium. Um, and a lot of us are doing just pure table sugar and sea salt. And mm. so I'm wondering, do I need to supplement potassium, magnesium, calcium possibly in this well, mix? Well, sea salt sea salt isn't plain table salt remember that it might have some other electrolytes in there okay. as other minerals if you like and yeah. um, so it table salt is plain uh sodium chloride okay. whatever is in sea salt that's why like pink himalayan salt can be used as a replacement for electrolytes because it has other minerals oh so there use pink. Be, go pink well that's what i've recommended in the past yeah for like Sweet. a for for a kind of a make it yourself um yeah. energy drink which is like i mean i've and... actually as i say this i've used pink probably half the time just because that's what i had at home so mm. oh, it's nice as well i like the taste of it um but like i i don't use i add my own electrolytes basically to everything that i have because and what do you use i just use the bulk powders uh plain electrolyte mix it's it is all for them though mm. and uh but in the right quantities because it's based on the sweat you rate. Email me a link to that so we can post it in the oh, show. For sure, yeah. yeah. Um it's it's based on the sweat concentration of those minerals, of those electrolytes. So that's what it's trying to replace. And that's obviously well, it's not obviously, but that probably where the data that they put into that development came from. Um but yeah, I mean sea salt and uh and pink himalayan salt they do contain other minerals anyway so um that's all good this has been awesome i want to respect the time that you have i'm wondering we had some other ones topics of like getting to the end of longer races with gas in the tank going through stage races um I love supplements and there's a lot of things that we could talk about would you want to do another podcast in like a month or? Do I have a feeling, Brendan, if I start talking about supplements, I won't be able to stop talking. And I, do I know need to stop talking. <laughs> can so, we do, a, yeah. can we do a part two? And actually what I'd love to do in here and say, Hey, people email me or cause people are going to love this podcast. You have, as I said, from the get-go, you've forgotten more than most of us know. Would you be down to do another podcast? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Ask actually asking the question as to what people would want to know is useful. Yeah. Um, and like, I'm happy for people to say, actually, I don't think you, I don't agree with this sort of thing. So I'm happy for that as well. If there's anybody that okay. doesn't Any, agree like, with anything. Entre... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, but give I me a heads up on that one. Don't kind of spring that one on me on the, <laughs> on the podcast. I love to spring, yeah. I like to spring awkward questions sometimes on the podcast. It make, keeps it spicy. What's, Lot uh, two easy questions. So actually, well, what would be the any take anything that we missed in this one or final words that you want to share on an actionable item, whether someone is a new cyclist or a more experienced cyclist? Like, what should they take away from this? I think uh go out on a three-hour bike ride with your mates or with a on a chainy or something like that, or even in a race, mm -hmm. and actually go through and add up how much carbohydrate was in each of the products that you used and how much you actually ate and see if that's anything less than 60 grams an hour no wonder you died at the end and if you're going to be really finickety about it look at your hydration intake as well if that's anything less than 500 mils an hour then again no wonder you died of death at the end <laughs> so that'll be that's the easiest thing to do but people uh 
We didn't do that. Well, I was actually, sorry to cut you off. We didn't do race day. How many grams of carbs an hour? Oh, that's always particular. That's, that's, that's going to be dependent, uh, athlete dependent. If they can't, it depends on what their stomachs can handle. Um, let's say they're but, good. Let's I, say they're, they've been eating carb. They're, uh-huh. they're good to go. What would be, yeah, your... if I can get them at hundred to 120, I'd be happy. Um, and I especially love when I can get girls to 120. I have a girl doing the, I just, I'll have to say this really quickly, but I have a girl doing the Grand Fondo World Champs this week. And she messaged me during the week and she was like, yes, Ellen, I hit 110 grams an hour. And she's tiny. And uh, and she was like, she was so happy, you know? Whereas other people, if I start off with them and I say, right, okay, so we're going to get you to 110 grams per hour. And they're like, ooh, no, I can't possibly eat so much food. It's not that hard. And I actually had someone reach out to me and they said it's very irresponsible to be making a general carb recommendation, like a hundred grams an hour. I think we put, put in a video once 90 and I said, well, okay, let's talk about this. If you are a small cyclist that has 200 watt threshold, are you burning 400 calories an hour? And they said, of course. I said, so you're at a huge advantage versus me where you're still in a deficit. I'm as an 80 kg athlete and I'm doing 300 Watts for an hour on higher for a race. I have such a massive deficit by the end. That's not a humble brag of Watts. That's I wish I was tinier. So I didn't have to push this massive <laughs> mass of human on a but, bicycle. But so it's you like, have the advantage there of having bigger muscles. So your ability to carbohydrate load and glycogen load beforehand will be a lot greater than theirs. So you're not really out of the deficit, but that's me pulling hairs. Sorry. Oh, wait, no, this actually makes me feel better. I didn't. Yeah, yeah. So. So your um, muscle. So you've then got, wait a minute. You, you have generally uh, a higher muscle mass than someone who is like 50 kilos. And well, what I'm going to say <clears throat> is that. Hmm. Because I was thinking in my head that small athlete, they let's say I eat 150 grams in an hour. That's 600 calories. I'm going to be 500 calories in a deficit per hour. So finish a five hour banger. That's 2,500 calories. Now I realize we're not supposed to be counting calories, but I just think it's an easy number for people to get their head around. Whereas a smaller athlete might only be 800 calories in a deficit. So break that down into carbs for calories per gram of carb. I'm way more carb in deficit than they are. But to your point, I can load more. The day before. Okay. And that's now what's the difference I now I need to go because I think what is it my isn't that between like 450 to 600 grams depending on your size is that a right ballpark could be uh in terms of um muscle glycogen yeah yeah it could be up and could could be up to 800 grams uh, depending on the so 150 grams so I'm gonna poke holes back 150 gram difference let's say or maybe more 200 well, gram difference they could be on 500 they could only have 400 grams you and see, i'm at 800 how small they are and you could have 800 grams okay so maybe it is okay so yeah 2000 calories so that's about even okay i feel better or just that. chop off a limb brendan then you'll have less I've, to carry around i have considered that but no i'm gonna keep on <laughs> ellen thank you so much for doing this my last question what's the best way for people to follow you do you blog twitter instagram obviously what's the best place to keep up with what you're doing probably uh my website is actually probably the best place to get in touch with me but okay. uh, to keep up with what, what, what i'm doing not necessarily what i'm doing but what my athletes are doing is uh Mac- ellen at or ellen underscore mcd nutrition awesome the website is mcd nutrition however if people google that what comes up mcdonald's hey got it hey. so i need so, to work out work on that send me your <laughs> well you get some links from this some backlinks will help you send me when you send me that um the electrolyte electrolyte thing yeah send me the links that you want me to post here and we'll get those out and then we'll circle back and plan the next one and i'll get feedback from people and then maybe in like so we're recording this august 2nd we'll probably post this in the beginning of september i think we're up to and then maybe we'll do another one like as people go into their base season and we can talk about also base miles yes. and that type of thing and then eating oh let me put this out base miles nutrition and yeah, then and, and testing strength nutrition, strength training, nutrition, if things change. And, and, testing. and, and testing, like and metabolic test- testing. Okay. We've got another Thanks. podcast going. Thank yeah, you so much for doing this. I really appreciate you taking worries. the time out of your day. This was awesome. Um, everybody will post the links, reach out to Ellen if you want some professional help. Clearly there is a ton to learn and 
you know, having a guide with you down through your journey will no doubt get you down the road faster. No pun intended. Um, thanks for listening, everybody. We'll talk to you soon.